Hi again and welcome back. This, as you can see, is Module 2 and in it we're going to continue to give you a high-level overview of Scrum and reinforce some of the ideas that I introduced to you in Module 1. This is the first of two modules called Scrum Essentials. So let's make a start and remind you yet again that the towering giants of Scrum were in fact developed over 20 years ago by Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland. And as I've said, Scrum is a simple framework within which people can address complex problems, and indeed simple ones, and productively and creatively develop products of the highest possible value. It's also a very efficient and effective process. Now, we learned about sprints in the last module, and I talked about the daily Scrum. Now, this is an internal team, i.e. the development team, inspect and adapt meeting to update the state of development and to resolve any problems. The key words here are inspect and adapt, which is a watchword for Scrum. Now, a daily Scrum, as you might imagine, <laughs> occurs each day during the sprint. So if a sprint is lasting five days, you'll have five daily Scrum meetings. What happens here is the team has a short meeting called the Daily Scrum, where they inspect their progress and make any necessary adaptions to maintain that progress. That's your inspect and adapt right there. Now, you'll be familiar with this type of diagram where you can see that the sprint will last typically from two to four weeks, or it could be as little as one week, and that you'll have daily scrums emanating from that. These are both cyclic processes, because of course, during a particular project stage, you may well have several sprints. And sprints occur sequentially, so that once a sprint is complete and finished, then the next sprint starts. And at the beginning of each, you will carry out what is quite sensibly called sprint planning. And both Ken and Jeff have come up with some general guidelines about how long this should take. Typically two to four hours collaborative planning session to define what will be built in that specific sprint. And at the end, as you saw in the last module, you'll have something called a sprint review, which is an inspection by the team and customer to demonstrate to them the potential shippable product increment, or sprint if you will, and any requested changes are noted for the next sprint. That's in the sprint retrospective, if you recall. So the sprint review is there for the development team to demonstrate the product that has been created, whatever that might be. Then, if you remember, you have the sprint retrospective. This will typically be one to two hours in the form of a meeting to review how the Scrum team performed and how they may improve succeeding sprints. Remember, although Scrum is a framework for any particular individual project or indeed a sprint, it will have a unique team that may or may not have ever worked together in the past. So it's quite natural that as the team carry out the early sprints that they will learn from that and make the following sprints even more efficient and effective. So keeping a fairly high level view, let's you and I go over the basic Scrum concepts. Now, as you know, the use of Scrum by a product development team will help where the scope of the product, the scope meaning what's included and what isn't, to be developed may not be fully specified, yet despite that, rapid progress is required. And you know that if the scope is not fully developed, then neither will be the requirements and user stories which Scrum uses to represent requirements. So with that as a backdrop, it's quite normal and natural that the scope and requirements will evolve over the coming sprints. Now Scrum accepts that improved accuracy can only be achieved through experience and not by better estimating techniques. Estimating is using some tools and good stuff to actually guess if you think about it. You can only base estimating on experience. And there's no magic bullet to plug thoughts into a black box and out comes a perfect estimate. I'm afraid that isn't ever going to happen. So experience is key here. Now, sprint scope can be adjusted based on the previous sprint team productivity. We'll see that's called velocity in a minute, so that future sprint estimates, in other words, the ones that are coming next, become more and more predictable. So velocity of the previous sprints is used as a benchmark, if you will, to adjust the scope of subsequent sprints. 
that are able to be achieved by the available resources within the team. I've got a whole section coming much later on estimating and you can be sure we'll go into a lot of detail about velocity, how it's calculated and how it's used. So sprints, also known generally as time boxes, have a constant duration so that any change that's needed during them is accommodated or adjusted, if you will, by varying scope and or the budget. If like me, you've come from a traditional project management environment, then you'll know about the six performance criteria, time, cost, scope, benefits, and risk. And with a traditional project, scope will be held constant and you would vary, for example, time and costs. Here it's the reverse, where time is held constant and you can only adjust any of the other performance variables from the point in time when the sprint starts to when it finishes. As you would expect, we'll also be covering that in detail in later modules. Now, if for example, not all of the sprint backlog items, do you remember there, that's used at the front end of a sprint, if they can't be completed, then the scrum master, or maybe the product owner, may reduce the scope by actually removing some items from the sprint backlog. And what would you expect would happen if that occurred? Well, the answer is the parts that you removed, so as part of sprint planning for the next sprint, they may be added back in, or they may indeed be modified in some way. But what about the other side of the coin? We know that sprint has a fixed duration. Well, what if the team were able to deliver more in a sprint than was originally estimated based on velocity from the previous sprint? Then in that case, the reverse is true. The scrum master may add items to the sprint backlog. Moving on to the essentials of Scrum. Scrum projects include five essential activities plus two common agile practices for product development. I've introduced you to these in the previous module. Now these processes enhance efficiency and performance from the first day to the last day of your project. So let's look at these five essential plus two common agile practices in turn, starting with project planning. Now, this is the initial planning for your project, and that would include creating a product vision statement and a product roadmap. And in future modules, we'll be taking that concept further. Keeping on project planning, project planning is a common agile practice, but it is not part of the Scrum activity. So you will find this is one of the secrets to taking Scrum with a Prince2 wrapper and linking the two together. Now, project planning can take place in as little time as just one day. You can well imagine perhaps a one-day workshop would get the job done. And when we talk about project planning in a Prince2 context, you'll automatically think of documents and Gantt charts and the like. Clearly, Scrum does something a little different, but you'll be pleased to know that we can, in fact, connect them together. Next up, release planning. This is where you plan the next set of released product features and then go on to identify the product launch date around which the team can mobilize. I've got a great diagram in the next module that pulls all these ideas together. Keeping on release planning, one release at a time is planned on agile projects and hence Scrum. The reason I use the word agile rather than Scrum is because release planning is not an official Scrum activity. But what you and I will be using is something which I've called extended Scrum, which does include this activity and allows it to dovetail nicely into Prince 2. Sprint, you're familiar with the term already, a short cycle of development and another name for sprints can be iterations, although I would suggest you stick to the name sprints, it's easier to say. And as you know, this is in which the team creates potentially shippable product functionality. Sprints can last as little as one day, but should not be longer than four weeks as a general guideline. Remember, within each sprint, you'll be having daily scrums. Continuing, sprint planning, different to release planning, as you know. This is a meeting at the start of each sprint where the scrum team commit to a sprint goal. This meeting identifies the requirements that support this goal and the individual tasks that get carried out during the sprint needed to complete each requirement. So. You have a requirement in the form of a user story. This will end up with many others in what's known as the product backlog. And in preparation for each sprint, you'll have a subset of those taken out, and that is called the sprint backlog. 
and it is the sprint backlog that is used as a basis to identify these requirements. The daily scrum, which you're also familiar with now, normally a 15 minute meeting held each day in a sprint. And it's been found that it's best to do this standing up if possible, possibly in a small meeting room, someone taking some notes if necessary, and you go around the team members one at a time. What you're basically doing here is to check what's been achieved, what hasn't been achieved, what each team member is going to be working on for the rest of the day, and any impediments or issues that need to be resolved. So as I said, the development team members agree the day's priorities, state what they did yesterday, what they will focus in this current day, and whether they have any roadblocks, also called impediments, or you and I would know them as issues. Then the sprint review, which is actually a presentation, a meeting at the end of each sprint, introduced by the product owner, where the development team stand up and take a bell because they demonstrate the working product functionality that they have completed during the sprint. And finally, the sprint retrospective, which looks back on the sprint itself. And it's here where the whole scrum team discusses what went well, what could change, what they could do better, and how to make any changes. And remember, sprints occur one after the other. And in a typical project stage, you may well find many sprints held sequentially. So these steps would occur for each of those sprints. So what exactly does Scrum do? Well, first you need to understand that Scrum is a specialized subset of Agile, focusing on the delivery aspects. So the Scrum process is designed for fast and efficient delivery, as well as significant boosts in return on investment for those very reasons. And frankly, Scrum can be used with any particular project management methodology you wish. You see, a traditional project's delivery process could really be seen as a black box with a focus on managing the project's process. And you blend Scrum within that. Okay, Scrum has its strength at the team level where, of course, the development has to be done. Typically, seven to nine individuals, very often with cross-functional skills. Scrum, as you've learned, is an iterative and incremental agile software development framework for managing product development. Now, I did own up in the first module and say that that's where its roots are. But the fact of the matter is, is that Scrum can be used for any type of product. So please don't just use it for your IT projects. You could use this for projects as diverse as organizational redevelopment, launching a new sales campaign, carrying out feasibility studies, and so on and so forth. Now, unlike traditional software development projects that produce a lot of superfluous documentation, <laughs> I'm sure just like me, you've been there too, along with what Scrum would call artifacts, what you would probably call products, that do not positively contribute towards the goal of creating working products, Scrum has only three. Let me reinforce that again. I can recall back in the 80s when I was working for a very large international computer company and the methodology that we had to use or modify a little if we wanted was top to toe with key documents. And I would often see, quite frustratingly, some of my best engineers sitting down in front of a screen for days and days and days, possibly several weeks, creating some very technical document. Now, all right, some of them may have been worthwhile. Indeed, some sprints might be used to create them. But looking back, I can see that we over-documented everything. So Scrum has peeled away those layers and come up with a super slick, fast and powerful set of artifacts, as they're called. First up, the product backlog. Second, the sprint backlog. And third, the product increment. So here we go. How does Scrum go about doing this? Well, it uses a time box, that's a sprint, and iterative approach to delivering products, solutions, software, hardware, you name it. It uses a collection of techniques, which we'll go into in far more detail, such as daily stand-up meetings, sprints, and user stories. Third, using the Scrum framework, and I'll continue giving you more information on that in the very next module. Now, as you already know, Scrum has a backlog and sprint structure specifically designed for delivering product solutions or software. And I described briefly that a user story describes who wants the feature and why they need it. 
I'll be sharing with you a very simple and powerful template, if you will, that shows you exactly how to express this. So if you're thinking, what sort of a user story do I need to write here? What sort of structure does it have? Don't worry, it's a very simple template and it'll allow you to create user stories fairly quickly. The product backlog, which as you know, is a prioritized list of new features. Could be user stories, I would say almost certainly they will be user stories. And this is what's known as the product backlog from which you extract what's known as the sprint backlog. That's the subset of this. So the sprint backlog consists of those products that you can complete and release early to get early customer benefits. A sprint is typically two to four weeks long, as you know, consisting of items from the top of the product backlog, and we mean top in terms of priority, that the team decides can be done from the sprint backlog. What does it look like? Well, here's a little concept diagram. Here's where the sprint starts, and here's where the sprint finishes, and you've got your daily stand-up meetings. And the sprint framework, if I can call it that, helps you to complete the products as efficiently and effectively as possible. So you end up with a shippable product. Good, well, that brings us to the end of module number two. In module number three, we'll be continuing looking at Scrum Essentials. Thank you for your time and attention. You and I will meet again on the next module. So bye for now.